uh, before we move any farther, go through and, and roll call. Jason Beebe? Here. Are you? Okay, thank you. Janet Hutchison? Here. Thank you. Patricia Youngman? Here. Neil Merritt? Here. Jeff Papke said he would not be. Jeff, or by any chance, are you here? Okay. Uh, Teresa Rodriguez? Teresa? I think you're on mute. Teresa? Okay, well, we'll come back to you later. And uh, at this point, let's stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation and God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, before we move on, just a reminder, if you're not speaking, please leave your, your system on mute so to keep to minimize our background noise and also identify yourself when you start speaking so that everyone else can know who, who is speaking. Um, Mr. Forrester, are there any additions to the agenda? There are no additions tonight, Mayor. Okay, thank you. The consent agenda was circulated. Are there any questions or concerns about the minutes or the uh, other items in the consent? I have a question. This is Councillor Merritt about the Pine Cedar liquor license. Does it matter to us if they have a couple boxes that are not checked? Page 16, questions 19 and 20. Is the chief on? Yeah, Lisa or chief, can you respond to that question, please? I am here and this is the chief of police, Dale Cummins. And can she tell me what the two questions are? Oh, I don't have it pulled out, I, but I, um, do you have it? I, can, I do. I, uh, question 19 states, do you or will you have any ownership interest in a business that manufactures wholesales or distributes alcohol in Oregon or another U.S. state. Okay, and yes, sir. Those boxes do need to be answered, so we should probably return that. Okay. Lisa, are you on? Did you hear that? Okay, Lisa's not on. So. And I apologize, sir. I should have caught that. No worries, we'll pull that one. So I think probably we have a, what's our parliamentary procedure counselor on uh, adjusting the consent agenda to reflect that this uh, application, liquor license application for the Pine Theater is incomplete. We would uh, move to, ex somebody needs to move to exclude that application. Uh, pages 11 through I think it's 19. Um, no, 18. Two. So uh, there needs to be a motion to exclude the liquor license application from Pine Theater LLC. 217. 11 through 17. Okay, is there a motion to exclude pages 11 through 17? I'll make the motion to exclude pages 11 through 17. And this is Janet. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion with a second to eliminate from the consent agenda pages 11 through 17, which has to do with the Pine Theater liquor license. So that would effectively remove the liquor license approval from the consent agenda. On the motion, um, on the amendment to the or to the consent agenda, is um, you still need a vote. On we do need a vote on that, so I'll just go through. Are there any questions on that vote first? If hearing none, I'm, I'll go through a roll call vote. 
Uh, aye or nay? Jason Beebe? Aye. Janet Hutchison? Aye. Patricia Youngman? Aye. Gail Merritt? Aye. Teresa Rodriguez? Teresa, are you with us? She is not. Uh, and, and the mayor says aye as well. So of those present, we have unanimous approval to remove the Pine Theater liquor license from the consent agenda. With that amendment made, is there um, a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda as otherwise circulated? This is Councilor Youngman, and I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. And this is Janet Hutchison. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion to approve the consent agenda with the Pine Theater uh, section deleted from that. Are there any questions or concerns? Hearing none, we'll go through a roll call vote. Jason Beebe. I will abstain from voting since I wasn't at the last meeting. Okay. Uh, Janet Hutchison. Aye. Patricia Youngman. Aye. Gail Merritt? Aye. Jeff Papke is absent. Teresa Rodriguez? Uh, no vote. And the mayor votes aye as well. So we have uh, a majority voting. All, in, all who voted voted in favor with one abstention. Motion passes. Let's move on to uh, visitors' appearances and requests. Were there, are there, have there been any written comments to be, to be presented? James, is there anyone online that would like to make a comment? Uh, there's one person on the public hearing line. I can unmute it momentarily. Okay, if you would, please. Okay, all participants on the public hearing line have been unmuted. Okay. Identify yourself and please give us a street address and present to the council. This is Caroline Irvin. I don't have anything to present. Uh, as part of oh. the budget committee, I am participating in the meeting tonight to hear the financial update. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Caroline. All right. Yep. Are, is there anyone else who would like to make a comment or anyone who would like to make a comment to the council? Hearing none, let's move on to uh, council business. Uh, under council business, we have the intent to award street habilitate rehabilitation project. Thank Mr. you, Mayor. Scott Smith, your street superintendent. <clears throat> so one quick um, edit to this um, staff report. My estimate was 714,000. It's listed as 780,000, so that was an error. So in your packet, um, we went out to bid for the rehabilitation of a little over 733,000 square feet of city streets. We received bids May 21st. Um, and we have, I have listed the, the streets that we'll be doing. It's, um, we'll be doing a standard two inch overlay up in the um, Northridge development. This is primarily all the curbless streets. And then we'll be doing a grind and inlay. Um, a little bit downtown, we're gonna finish up um, grinding and inlaying um, Elm Street that outside the parameters of the bridge project, um, Elm Street between second and third by Pioneer Park. And we'll also be doing um, fourth street behind city hall from Elm to court street. And with that, we'll change the angle of the diagonal parking to help mitigate some of the traffic impacts that we've all um, heard from people back there when the city manager parks his big long Ford F-350 out there and 
it blocks part of the the drive lane. So we'll we'll make some some fixes to that, and that'll all help there. I'm also going to be doing a seal coat in uh, Iron Horse Two um, development. This is off a of Wayfinder up by the Iron Horse Lodge. Um, that's about 136,000 square feet. And we'll be doing a set amount of $40,000 worth of crack seal. So after opening bids last Thursday, um, the bids are as follows. Tri-County paving $628,837.50. High Desert Aggregate, Six hundred and forty-eight thousand nine hundred and seventy. Knife River Corporation, six hundred and ninety-seven thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. Granite Construction, seven hundred thousand seven hundred, and we received a bid, a non-responsive bid at that from Seven Peaks Paving. Once again. My estimate was 714,000, not the 780 that um, is in this. And after reviewing um, all the documents, um, we asked that the city council approve the intent to award the 2020 street rehabilitation project to Tri-County Paving based out of Redmond. Their asphalt plant is across from the airport up on top of the hill here in the amount of $628,837.50. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was very tactful of you not to mention my white pickup truck that is also parked next to the city manager's pickup truck on 4th it's Street. Not quite as long. And it's not quite as long as Steve's, so. <laughs> Regardless, thank you very much. Are there any questions from the council? All right, hearing none, is there a motion from anyone on the council? This is Janet Hutchison. I'll make a motion to um, move the intent to award for the 2020 Street Rehabilitation Project to Tri-County in the amount of $628,837.50. Thank you, is there a second? This is Patricia, I'll second it. Thank you, Patricia. Are there any questions or concerns or anxieties about this moving forward? Thank you. Hearing none, let's vote. Jason Beebe. Aye. Janet Hutchison. Aye. Patricia Youngman. Aye. Gail Merritt. Aye. Teresa Rodriguez, are you on yet? Guess not. Okay, and I vote aye as well. So we have a unanimous vote of those present. So that, uh, that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. All right, next on our agenda, we have the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. We'll start out again this evening uh, with some reminders on city projects. The city continues construction under social distancing guidance on the ASR project, the senior center remodel project, the 10th and Main Street realignment later to commence later this year, and as you just heard from uh, Scott Smith, our street superintendent, the 2020 overlay project for city streets. So once again, uh, despite some of the challenges we're faced with, we're continuing with city infrastructure and uh, investment in our infrastructure with these projects. From the finance side, uh, Director Liz Schutte has uh, mentioned last council meeting has successfully negotiated a favorable rate of less than 2% for refunding our current loan for the public safety building, and we do anticipate closing that transaction by the end of this week. So that's very good news for what the city's trying to do to upgrade the aging facility and move Dale and his team up on the hill. On the railroad side, um, as many of you know, and if you don't, Brightwood Corporation, one of the largest employers in the Tri-County region, has had 
this past year purchased uh, Pioneer Cutstock and set up operations here. Uh, recently with the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on their markets, they were forced to do some significant layoffs and uh, really cut back uh, most of all their production here in Prineville. Um, having said that, Brightwood has developed into a great customer for our uh, City of Prineville Railroad Freight Depot. We store a lot of lumber for them. And the very good news we heard today is, uh, as of this morning, uh, Brightwood has restarted the Prineville facility at full capacity. This is very good news for one of Central Oregon's largest employers and a new employer to Crook County. So I think that's very indicative of uh, a recovery uh, is in uh, process here in Crook County, putting some people back to work. From Meadow Lakes, Zach reports uh, good golf activity over the weekend and also wanted to advise the council that we expect to have bid documents for our new irrigation system out here shortly in the next few weeks. Uh, we're replacing our aging irrigation system that's passed its useful life. On the public works side, uh, Eric and his team wanted everybody to understand uh, we have experienced some delays as you probably figured out with the rehabilitation of the city parking lot just a few blocks away from where we're, where City Hall is now. And what has happened is uh, during that reconstruction process, we uncovered what turned out to be the old Ochico Hotel uh, fuel uh, tank. It's about a 10,000 gallon tank and uh, approximately had uh, 4,000 gallons of number five bunker oil still in the tank. Uh, we don't see uh, a lot of uh, spillage or degradation. Uh, we're working with state and federal agencies and local contractors to dispose of the oil and the tank soon and that will allow the project to resume. So we'll try to get that done over the summer as soon as practical and get that parking lot back in service. And finally tonight, uh, from the public safety side of the street, uh, Chief Dale Cummins and the city team is very pleased to announce that uh, Todd Rich will be joining the Prineville Police Department as a sergeant starting next Monday. Sergeant Rich will be our fourth sergeant, and this will be returning our Prineville, Department, uh, Prineville Police Department uh, sergeant staff to full strength and very importantly allow 24-hour supervisory coverage for our uh, police officers out on the street. So we look forward to the swearing-in ceremony at the next council meeting with our new chief, Mr. Todd Rich. That concludes my report. Are there any questions? Thank you. Only that he won't be your new chief, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say new chief? <laughs> I, I oh. didn't get that email. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, Dale. Uh, I meant to say he is our new sergeant, and I, I uh, made a mistake. Apologize for that. And on another note, Dale, we need to have a meeting with you tomorrow at 8. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on. Um, Liz Schutte and Lori Hooper, our quarterly financial report. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and members of the Citizen Budget Committee. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are present, but if during this presentation you have uh, a need to ask questions, please feel free. Next slide, please, James. So this is a snapshot of where we are at at the end of the third quarter and what we are currently projecting for year end, fiscal year 2020, the first half of our biennial budget. This first slide is all funds combined, showing beginning fund balance budgeted at $19.97 million, audited actual coming in at $20.45 million, or approximately $479,000 over the estimated budget. All city funds have decreased roughly 7% or $1.45 million through the third quarter ending March 31st, 2020. Funds significantly decreasing fund balance during the quarter include transportation, wastewater, SDC funds, airport, all of which is due to budgeted capital projects 
and the Internal Service Funds Administration and Public Works Administration both will level out by year end. Next slide, please. I want to take a few minutes to describe what you're looking at before we move forward. Um, in the left, to, I mean to the left, in the brown is the quarter budget shows what we have actually collected or expended during the third quarter based on the annual budget divided by four. In the green is what we have collected or spent through the third quarter against the annual budget. The background color shows how much more we need to collect or have to spend. And the blue shows our current year on estimates, which seem to change daily with all these projects going on. This is a biennial budget, and what is showing in the rust colored area is our biennial budget total. What percent has been spent to date, and how much is remaining? The focus of my presentation will mainly be in the green and blue areas of the slide. In the general fund, it is on track for the end of the third quarter with estimates for property tax collections currently at 98% at quarter end, transient lodging tax total 73% of total budget, year-end projection is 60,000 less than budgeted. Franchise fees are tracking at 69% of the budget with year-end projections estimated to exceed that number by 17,000. Other revenues are tracking in a positive way, estimated to exceed annual budget by 30,000. Expenditures in police are estimated to exceed the annual budget, slightly um, exceed the estimated annual budget in materials and services by the end of the year. The decrease and the decrease will either, um, I'm sorry, I messed up. <laughs> I'm not used to this Zoom stuff. So police expenditures are at 74% of the budget. And this figure will be um, made up either um, by a budget adjustment in the next annual budget or by be absorbed within that budget. And the same is holding true for non-departmental. They are at 67% of their budget, estimated to be slightly over that budget. And we will either absorb that in the next annual um, budget, 2021, or we will um, in, adjust the budget from contingency in the following year. Uh, the, the expenditures in the police department are due to materials and services being over, and the over expenditure in the non-departmental is due to a biomass project. Next slide, please. Fund balance trends for the general fund show a continual improvement, increasing roughly $234,000 from 2019. Next slide, please. Property tax collection for the third quarter is roughly $2.14 million, an improvement over the prior year third quarter collection of roughly $107,000. Next slide, please. Delinquent tax collection, approximately 2,000 more from the prior year at $46,000. Natural gas is down slightly 5,500 over the prior year, coming in at roughly 89.9. Cable TV is down over the prior year at roughly 34.5. And electrical franchise fees is up over prior year collection of 1.9 million totaling roughly $2.01 million. Next slide, please. Transient lodging tax is down over the prior year roughly $80,000, totaling $277,000. Franchise and transient tax have seen a downward trend largely related to the COVID crisis, crisis that we are having.
Any questions on the general fund? The FCC collections overall, um, transportation remaining basically flat, totaling 533,000. Water increasing largely due to ASR project collection totaling 4.95 million and wastewater collecting $127,500. They're kind of all over the place. I'm going to um, have Eric Klon talk about the SC SCC project on the following four slides. Eric? Yep, let me get unmuted. <clears throat> so we have with all the growth, we have several projects going <clears throat> in our STC accounts um, right here. The, the life of an engineer is not always glamorous. So one of our <clears throat> city projects was to install a new aeration system in the wastewater treatment plant. So how the aeration system currently worked was <clears throat> we had a series of essentially floating paddles that would stir up the water and provide oxygen with that said, all of the unfortunate things get flushed down the toilets. Um, we're wreaking havoc with that. And so we moved to an off or offshore on land aeration system that then just moves the aeration out so that those rags don't um, cause problems. So this picture is from last summer when we were installing this. This is our assistant city engineer, Mike Kasperger. And unfortunately, he is in the wrong sewer and moving a large um, mat of hair there. So pretty horrible. Moving forward, this is our design um, in the Transportation SDC Department. We're getting quite close to being done with the design for the 10th and Main <clears throat> project. This project has been somewhat delayed, but we're now moving forward with it. And that'll be really nice to um, really fix that offset intersection and provide some really good pedestrian facilities for those businesses to the north to get down to the um, retail stuff to the south. Transportation department also just recently ended up construct or recently finished constructing the Elm Street Bridge. That project um, was great, good contractor on it. We're very pleased with how it turned out. And then probably the biggest, pro or definitely the biggest project we have right now is the Oxford Storage and Recovery Project. <clears throat> so this is where we'll store water during the winter when there's very low demand and be able to access it through high volume pumps during the summer. So the, the source for this water is all the work we're doing down at Leshwab Field. We're constructing a series of 20 shallow wells, a water treatment facility that would then pump that into the system and then eventually move it up to the airport area to be stored in that very confined aquifer. Is so there any more questions? Oh. Excuse me? Go ahead, Liz. I just wondered if there was any more questions about the SDC fund. Did you have something, Mary? Nope, I'm good. I any questions, I'd be happy to answer, but I think we've been talking about those projects with council quite a bit. Okay. Moving on, transportation funds through the third quarter is approximately 73% of budget. The state gas tax revenue is down slightly from the prior year at 183300 Year-end projections total 1.545, approximately 62000 less than the budgeted annual excuse me, the annual budget. Expenditures in the personal services and materials and services are tracking. Capital projects are projected to be over annual budget, but will be made up the following budget, 2021. Questions about the transportation fund? Moving on to the railroad, the railroad fund is at 87% of the total revenue combined charges for service for the railroad total 243,000 to date and freight depot charges of service totaling 183,400. Year end estimates combined are estimated at 923,000 
approximately 135000 over the annual budget. The expenditures for tracking with annual budget, excuse me, expenditures are tracking with the annual budget in personnel services at 73%, materials and services at 88%, and capital outlay year-end estimate is over annual budget. Overage will be offset with additional revenue or decreased spending in 2021. Next slide, please. The fund balance increased over the prior year roughly $100,000, totaling $1.127 million. Good job, Matt. Next slide, please. Thank you. Charges for service collections for the third quarter from FY 2011 through FY 2020, showing a slight increase over the prior year in both railroad and the freight depot. Matt has the next two slides, and we'll talk about what's going on out at the railroad. Hey, good evening, Liz. Um, thank you. So the slide thank you're looking you. at is a is a picture of a uh, well just a plain picture of an office, but it's exciting to us. Um, in 2014, we started consolidating our offices. Um, we had the chamber office, one up behind Dave Barlow's and one at the freight depot. And we consolidated all that to the freight depot. I've been operating out of about 650 square feet. Uh, the office you see there on the slide is about 1,500 square feet. So all of the freight depot and railroad operations will move into that office. Um, towards the end of July. We're paying for this with a lease with a new company called Kraut Pipe. Um, and part of that lease, uh, they wanted to, rent, to lease our old office, our 650 square feet. So by leasing the old office over time and the, and the length of the lease, we'll pay for this new office. So we're excited. It wasn't a budgeted um, capital, but we'll be able to uh, offset that cost over time. The next slide. So the next slide you'll see a picture of a citizen took of our three locomotives. Um, that's all three in our fleet. Uh, that was a late Saturday evening. We were going over to pick up 100 um, storage cars for the City of Prineville Railway to, to put into storage. Uh, the beginning of March when we saw the COVID-19 um, pandemic start. Um, There's about two weeks where our business got really slow. It was almost concerning, but what, what happened was our business kind of flipped. And so instead of a lot of uh, services or truck to truck transfers or, or customers um, bringing in carloads of material, uh, we, we had a lot of storage come on our line. And so this is a, a picture of us going to pick up uh, 100, 100 storage cars on a Saturday afternoon. Um, currently, we're le leasing out about 450 spaces. Um, so you'll see as we go into the fourth quarter, um, you'll see a pretty significant increase in our in our car storage and our switching fees. Um, our freight will go down a little bit, but but that'll make up for the switching and the store car storage will make up for that. So if there's any questions, or back to Liz. Thank you, Matt. The airport fund. Airport fund shows 58% of budgeted revenue has been collected. Driving a big portion of this is the intergovernmental revenue for the capital improvement project at the airport. Charges for services are at 57% of revenue. Year-end projections are down. This is due to the fuel prices and decreased activity at the airport. Expenditures are at 76% of the personnel budget and 56% of the materials and services budget. Capital project is on budget and coming along nicely. Next slide, please. The third quarter trends for charges for services for FY12 through FY20, showing a decrease over the prior year of approximately $55,500. I'm not sure if Kelly's on or not. I don't I think, think Kelly's on. Case. Yeah, so I, I can I can help you out here. Yeah. So the big news at the airport, one of the biggest projects we have with 
uh, really with Crook County was uh, working with very closely with our partners at Crook County to um, convince the Forest Service to build a hella base. We've been talking about it for a number of years. Uh, they do have occupancy of that base. The county has uh, uh, finalized the uh, lease agreement for that. And the real important thing from an operational standpoint for Kelly uh, and the airport is this really opens up the infrastructure to that, uh, what would be the kind of the, the northwest side of runway 28 um, for development. And so we now have power and water and, and wastewater services, uh, city services in that area, allowing for uh, future development. So this is a great, great opportunity for the rail, or excuse me, for the airport and uh, putting quite a few people in place up there. So more jobs on the airport facility as a result of this project. Thank you, Steve. Moving on to the golf course. The golf course is at 82% of budget through the third quarter and totaling 1.58 million. The year-end estimate is projected at 1.09 million. This large increase over the prior year is due to the transfer of funds for the irrigation project of 750,000. Expenditures combined are at 35% of budget, showing golf at 32% wastewater disposal at 71%, and the restaurant at 50% for quarter year end. Despite the COVID-19 crisis, golf has been able to maintain revenue and expenses. Year-end estimates project to maintain fund balance at this point. I believe um, the irrigation project has put, been put off um, until the fall or perhaps the next spring. Um, Zach's going to be here in a minute. You can talk to him about the plans for that project. The next slide. Trending slide shows information from FY11 to 2020 at third quarter end. In FY19, the total revenue was 519800 down just slightly in 2020 at 5014800 dollars loss of about $5,000. That's great, Matt, or great, Zach. Thank you. On the golf activities, show daily play at 240500 part rental at 123100 and the pro shop sells at 78 8 Zach has the next two slides. Um, some of you have already seen the Pro Shop remodel, but I wanted the Citizen Budget Committee members to see it if they haven't. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, here you can see uh, what we did in the golf shop. Uh, things are looking pretty good from our remodel. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. These are just some pictures to show the Budget Committee our finished product. We finished about... Uh, a week before the shutdown from COVID. So that affected our pro shop sales a little bit as Liz showed on the last slides there. Um, good news from uh, all of this is when we put together the year in projections, it looked like we were going to be down pretty significantly revenue wise, just based on what we had seen through halfway through March and all of April, but we've rebounded pretty well here in May. So um, it looks like we're going to end up meeting our, original budgeted revenue numbers. So that's that's good for us, good for us moving forward. Um, and also, as Liz mentioned, the numbers look a little bit skewed because we had originally planned to do the irrigation project uh, in this first year of the biennium, but that's been pushed out to the second year. Um, so we're about to go out to bid for that. So um, that money will carry over into the next year um, of the biennium and hopefully we'll be able to um, get it completed at that point. So are there any questions on the golf course? Thanks. Thank you, Zach. The last fund we're going to talk about today is the building facility fund. Currently, the building facility fund is at 55% of revenues. The majority of the revenue comes from rents and transfers of users of the facilities. 
Year-end revenue projections include debt proceeds of $5.9 million for the public safety building, which the majority of this will refund the existing financing of $4 million, with additional dollars totaling $2.4 million to complete the project. Our original loan of $4 million had a rate of interest at 3.15%. The new borrowing will have an interest rate of 1.73%, and will save the city approximately 323500 in interest over the term of the loan. Expenditures in the fund are at 22%. This is a, a reflection of the project dollars for public safety, the senior center, and the city hall budget. All projects are getting a late start due to the current environment. Year-end estimates for the fund total $6.85 million, with an ending fund balance of $4.3 million, for projects continuing in the coming year. So the next couple of slides are Chief Dell to share what's going on in the police facility. Yes, ma'am, thank you, Liz. So this is Dale Cummins, the police chief. Um, with the additional funds that were secured by Liz and her team at the lower interest rate, we'll be able to take our project that was originally broken into four phases and get all of the phases completed at one time, allowing us to have a fully functional, not only police department, but a dispatch center, as well as a community room that can be used by uh, anyone who signs up to use it. And it'll be a fully functional facility, which we had grave concerns uh, prior to the ability of Liz and her team to secure the additional fundings at a lower rate because we would have had to spend several years trying to get the building up uh, to fully functional. So it's been a phenomenal opportunity here with that rate to be able to complete the building and have it ready uh, for use here, hopefully by maybe the early summer of next year. As you can see in some of these photos, a lot of the demolition has been completed, removing walls, um, and preparing to redesign the interior to be uh, designed on the first floor as a fully functional police department, on the second floor as a large dispatch center, which will provide years and years of service, uh, even as we expand um, over time, and also allow us to have a large community room where people can come and have meetings in a secure facility um, and be able to use our our facility in a community policing manner so that we can continue to engage. Um, so I really wanna take a moment with council to let them know that I and my team are very, very appreciative of all the work that Liz has done to assist us in being able to take care of this project in its entirety and to do so at a, a lower rate that saves the city money. Thank you, Dill. Is there any questions about the police facility project? I This is Councillor Gale, and I would like to make a comment. I was fortunate enough to take a tour on Friday, and I am so excited for the facility, and I went away knowing that we were doing the right thing for them. So if there's not any more comments um, or questions, this concludes the quarterly report and the budget update for the budget committee. Um, anytime, if you have any questions that you didn't ask, please give me a call anytime and I'd be happy to go over anything with you. We will be having a, a budget meeting, um, the last council meeting of June to uh, adopt our rate schedule and the taxes and any other items that need to be taken care of before year end. Thank you. Liz, thank you. All right, again, any last questions for Liz? Okay, hearing none, are there any comments or reports from many of the council members or anything, any issues regarding the COVID-19 that you would like to raise for discussion? All right, um, 
Well, then let's move on to the next item on our agenda is ordinances, ordinance number 1260, adding chapter 156 to City of Prineville Code Housing Receivership. First presentation, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mayor. In your packet, you'll find uh, ordinance 1260, and actually in the packet is the chapter 156, which is the suggestions for the addition to our code. I believe the actual ordinance 1260 was distributed today and that um, the ordinance itself simply just adopts the proposed chapter 156, which is in your packets of pages 50 through 52. This is known as the Housing Receivership Ordinance of the City of Primeville. And why this came about, you'll probably remember that a couple of weeks ago, multiple citizens have made, uh, next slide if you can, James. Multiple citizens have made written comments to council regarding certain properties in the community that have, were negatively impacting the property values. Uh, the city council requested staff and myself to research some legal avenues to perhaps address those issues, which we were able to do, and we came up with the ordinance that's in front of you today or tonight. Go to the next page. What your current options were prior to this ordinance, there's really two. One is the nuisance code, and the nuisance code does allow both the city and citizens to issue a complaint against property owners if a nuisance exists. A fine is, the fine associated with a nuisance is generally quite small, normally goes unpaid. The city does have the option to abate nu nuisances, and we've utilized that much more frequently uh, over the last couple of years. Nevertheless, a lot of the blighted properties uh, would not actually be considered nuisances pursuant to our code, and instead would be more appropriate for a violation of the building code. The building code violations can result in an issuance of a fine. Traditionally, building codes are much more enforceable at the inception of a plan or inception of a building. Uh, after which uh, it's already installed within the city. A lot of building code violations um, sort of go unnoticed, or at least the, the actual remedies that the city had for them were not necessarily satisfactory for, in particular, blighted properties. Uh, next slide. So blighted properties are, uh, are set out in the Oregon Revised Statutes in Chapter 457, which is incorporated within our building code to be a violation of the building code. And a blighted property has a variety of different um, uh, definitions to it. Uh, the first one's on, on this particular slide. And then the next slide, if you go to that, Mr. Wilson, uh, is all the other different types of definitions that come with a blighted property. And it's sort of at its core, a blighted property is a property that is, is a danger to the community because, uh, if you go to the next slide, James, um, that blighted areas cause an increase in and spread of disease and crime and constitute a menace to the health, safety, morals, and welfare of the residents of the state. And these conditions necessitate excessive and disproportionate expenditures of public funds for crime prevention and punishment, public health, safety, and welfare, fire, and accident protection and other public services and facilities. And that's actually pursuant to statute. So the Oregon legislature has already made a finding, this particular finding, that any property that fits the definitions of the previous two slides is actually detrimental to the safety, health, or welfare of the community. And so for that reason, the um, Oregon legislature uh, passed what's known as the Oregon Receivership Act, and that's found in the statutes 105.420 to 105.455, and that allows communities to deal with particular egregious properties that are problematic in neighborhoods. In particular, it allows a, a community like ourselves to enact the Oregon Receivership Act as part of our own code. And that's what we've done with the proposed Chapter 156, is we've adopted the statutes within 105.420 into our own code in Chapter 156. And really through this act, we are going to be able to identify blighted properties and the city can work with those property owners to hopefully remedy the blight through agreements or problem solving ideas. If that is not possible, it gives the city the ability to petition a court for what's known as a receivership. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, a receivership is defined as a person or entity appointed by a circuit court or a judge to take charge of a property during the pendency of a civil action or upon a judgment or order to manage and dispose of it as the court may direct. So in essence, what happens with a receivership is um, the city would be able to uh, petition a circuit court to ask it be named receiver. And if it was named receiver, then the court would grant it certain uh, rights and responsibilities to be able to remedy whatever situation brought that property in for court. So whether it was built, uh, taking the necessary construction steps to bring it up to code, um, even uh, demolishing a property, that would all be within um, the discretion of, of the court. So a judge would actually have to order it and could name the city the ability to do it. Uh, if that were the case, any costs associated with the receivership would constitute a lien to the property. It's very important to recognize, however, that this isn't an option that we go right to. This is, in, instead, this is an option that gives the city an ability to work with local property owners to have them self-remedy self, self -remedy techniques or tactics to actually uh, fix the blight themselves. And there's actually a long timeline that we have to go through in order to get to the receivership. And so we are hopeful that a receivership would be a rare occurrence and instead, through use of this ordinance, voluntary compliance would be achieved at a much higher rate than we have right now with the nuisance or building code. So in essence, it, it really gives the city staff in the city of Primeville an additional uh, tool to be able to um, appropriately uh, remedy the blighted properties around the area. And with that, I would have any questions. The ordinance, this is the first um, presentation. So if the ordinance were to pass uh, at this council meeting, it would be brought back in two weeks for a second presentation and then would go into effect 30 days thereafter. And so any questions, I'm, I'm here to answer. Jared, did any this is Janet Hutchison. So at any time, does that come back to the council like prior to it going to circuit court? Yes, actually, uh, in order, the, the actual identification of the property has to go through council at the really at the beginning. So staff would identify a property that could meet the definitions of a blighted, a blighted area, and we would have to come, or the city manager or designee would have to come to council, make a presentation on why the staff felt that it was a blighted property, and then the, the council would authorize uh, staff to move forward with that particular property. Into, into the receivership. That's correct. Yeah. So again, Janet, I think it's real important, and Jared touched on it, uh, that this is this is gives us a tool in the toolbox for what I would call an, an habitual problem that has been ongoing for a long time. We have tried everything that we know how to do with existing policies and code enforcement, and are just coming up uh, short of a, a remedy that's satisfactory. And this would give us a tool to, in essence, close that loop and take action. Correct, and and also along those lines especially in regards to habitual sort of offenders. Right. You know, the, the selection of properties is set out on uh, 156.04, and so it has to both be a violation of the building or housing code and also the owner not act within a timely manner to correct the violation. So before it even comes to council, there's going to be a process to try to remedy the situation. And then after the property is identified, we have to provide 60-day notice prior to filing with the circuit court. Thank you. Are there any, go ahead, go ahead. Are there any other questions? So it would not come to the council until after all other efforts had been attempted. That's correct. Unsuccessfully, all right, okay. Again, any other questions on ordinance number 1260? Is there a motion to approve ordinance number 1260 for the first presentation? This council, um, I'll move to approve ordinance number 1260 for the first presentation. 
I'll second it. Thanks, Gail. Okay, so ordinance number 1260, an ordinance adding chapter 156 to the Prineville City Code Housing Receivership Ordinance of the City of Prineville. Um, any questions, concerns, or anxieties? Hearing none, let's go to a vote. Mr. Beebe, how do you vote? Aye. Janet Hutchison? Aye. Patricia Youngman? Aye. Gail Merritt? Aye. Jeff, Mr. Papke is not present. Teresa Rodriguez, have you joined us? Okay, and the mayor votes aye, so we have a unanimous vote of those present. Thank you, and that will come back at our next city council meeting. All right, so let's move on to resolution number 1440, approving city of Pineville authorization to efficiently minimize or mitigate the effects of COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, what you have before you tonight uh, is consideration of resolution number 1440, which is the mayor set out. It's a resolution that will continue to authorize the city to efficiently minimize or mitigate the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. This uh, resolution has uh, been renewed since March, and the council continues to review the necessity of the declaration every 30 days. As you all know, co the COVID-19 pandemic has had uh, drastic and cataclysmic effects on our nation and state uh, and our local community, especially economies. Um, many of our citizens have been drastically affected financially through the regulations that have been that have been imposed to mitigate the spread of the virus. And large thanks to our local health officials, Crook County has been able to avoid wide community spread, and we are hopeful that that will continue. However, Primeville citizens will still require uh, resources from its governments to compensate for the sacrifices that they have and continue to make. Uh, this declaration allows the city to continue to apply for assistance and funds from both federal and state government for the city to pass along to its citizens to help mitigate and minimize the effects that this virus has created. Although it does continue a uh, declaration of emergency, that declaration is required and critical for access of funds for the city. Are there any questions from any of the council members? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve resolution number 1440, a resolution providing the city of Prineville authorization to efficiently minimize or mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic? This is Gail. I'll make a motion to approve um, resolution number 1440. Thank you, Gail. Is there a second? This is Janet Hutchison, I'll second. Janet, thank you. Again, any questions or concerns? Steve, uh, Mayor, I'd, not really a concern, just a, a follow up with what our counselor had said. This gives us the, the ability to um, get those funds or need, anything needed from the state. And we are following suit with the state. And I think there's some concerns in the community um, that we're basically trying to shut things down when I personally am not. I can't speak for the other counselors. I just wanted to say that I, but I understand the need for this. And we'll stand and say that, that we do need this to keep moving forward if, if something does get worse. And, and Jason, you're very accurate. This is by no means any effort to thwart or, or take away any rights of any of the citizens. This is simply a means by which or through which it, we gives, it gives us the opportunity to access funds and support for residents and businesses of, of the city. So, and as well as, as uh, resources for the city, the city itself, um, besides the residents. So, so thank you for your comment. Any other comments, questions? Let's go to a roll vote. Uh, Mr. Beebe, how do you vote? Aye. Janet Hutchison. Aye. Patricia Youngman. Aye. Gail Merritt. Aye. Mr. Kapke is absent. Teresa Rodriguez, are you with us? 
Okay, and the mayor votes aye as well, so resolution number 1440 passes. Let's go on to resolution number 1441, a resolution amending Prangle policies during the COVID pandemic. Um, again, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mayor. This is also a resolution that has been continually uh, revised and continually reviewed by both staff and the city council. Uh, as we all know, things change and have changed with the COVID-19 pandemic on a federal and state level uh, week by week. Uh, since our last council meeting, uh, two changes have occurred locally that require uh, this particular, our policies to be amended. And those two things were the Executive Order 2025 by Governor Brown and Crook County's approval to advance to phase one. Uh, those policies, these policies here are primarily for internal government operations. They'll have a little effect on the public at large. Uh, City Hall and the police lobby are closed to the general public. However, services remain available and uh, both by phone, internet, uh, and I believe that council, both the city staff and the police have done an exceptional job at meeting citizens' uh, needs in those regards. Uh, council meetings will consider will continually be by phone and by video, and that's consistent with Executive Order 2016 and Executive Order 20-25. Although citizens have not had the opportunity to physically come to our meetings, they have had the opportunity to participate by phone and by video. And in our um, our, uh, our analysts have said that uh, well, that's exponentially higher than the actual meetings that we had when we had people coming in. And so. Uh, I think that's a positive thing. It, importantly, and this sort of goes to Councillor Beebe's point in the last resolution, nothing in these policies nor the, the resolution previously uh, limit the movement or gathering of citizens, um, those, uh, nor does it prohibit any business or retail establishment from operating. Any restrictions uh, are based on state executive orders, and those regulations are, are um, enforced by those agencies. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council or concerns? Pretty quiet out there. Okay, hearing none, is there a motion to approve resolution number 1441? This is Councilor Beebe. Um, I will move to approve resolution number 1441. This is thank Patricia. You, Jason. Patricia, thank you for your second. Again, are there any questions or comments, concerns? Hearing none, let's go to a roll call vote. Mr. Beebe, you vote. Aye. Janet Hutchison. Aye. Patricia Youngman. Aye. Gail Merritt. Aye. Teresa Rodriguez, are you with us? Okay. And the mayor votes aye as well. So the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Then we move on to, uh, where are we on this? Resolution number 1442, um, amending ex amendment extending Brook County GIS services. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. For the record, James Wilson, IT manager. Before you tonight for consideration is resolution number 1442. This, this authorizes the extension of an IGA with Crook County for GIS services. The city contracts with Crook County for um, management of its geospatial, it's basically mapping information. Uh, that mapping data is used across uh, multiple different city departments, uh, including planning, engineering, public works, police, and emergency dispatch. Uh, it just makes sense for the city to get that uh, data from the county and to work as one collective set of layers uh, between the city and the county versus having uh, either a contractor do it or manage the GIS uh, information in-house with just the city, with, just within the city limits. Uh, this agreement has been in place for a number of years. This is just an annual renewal of that IGA. Uh, the budgeted funds uh, that are involved in the agreement um, are just about 25,000 across those various departments, and it has been included in all of their uh, annual operating budgets. Be happy to answer any other questions. Otherwise, staff would recommend approval of Resolution 1442. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, 
Hearing none, is there a motion to approve resolution number 1442? This is Janet Hutchison. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 1442 for an extension of GIS services through an intergovernmental agreement. This is. Thank you. This is. There a second. I'm sorry. Is that Patricia? Yep, I'll second that. Okay, Patricia, thank you for seconding that. Again, are there any questions or concerns moving forward with resolution number 1442? Hearing none, we'll go to a roll call vote. Mr. Beebe, how do you vote? Aye. Janet Hutchison? Aye. Patricia Youngman? Aye. Gail Merritt? Aye. Teresa is absent and, and Jeff Papke is absent and the mayor votes aye as well. So we have a unanimous vote on resolution number 1442, a resolution amending an intergovernmental agreement with Crook County regarding GIS support. Um, next on our agenda, we have resolution number 1443, a resolution exempting from competition a contract for the construction and installation of the bridge of the city of Prineville's Barnes Butte pedestrian bridge. Um, good evening, Eric Klein, Klein. City Engineer. Yeah, good hey, evening, Eric Klein, City Engineer. Several times we've discussed this potential project with council. This is our friends at Markham and Sons Construction that recently purchased or constructed the Elm Street Bridge. They're interested in trading a pedestrian bridge at Barnes Butte for a city-owned piece of property. This has all been correctly noticed in all of the journals of commerce and such. At the last meeting, we held a public hearing related to this contract exemption. We received no input. So now we simply come back to council with a resolution to codify that agreement. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Eric, this is Janet. So Hutchinson, so so why is it that you're not going to let the contract until 9-1-2021? Janet, that's related to um, an Oregon State Parks grant. So Oregon lottery dollars goes to fund um, grant dollars, and there's the potential that we could turn this $150,000 grant into an additional $225,000 of cash that we would then invest into the area. And so we're just needing the time to get the grant application in and hit all of their cycles. And if you tried to do it ahead of time? Yeah, many, that, many, many grants, they grant? do not allow you, they, many grants do not allow you to expend dollars ahead of time. And so that's why we would want to wait to try to match the against a future grant. Okay, thank you. Other questions? None? Okay. Is there a motion to approve resolution resolution number 1443, a resolution exempting from competition a contract for the construction and installation of the city of Prineville's Barnes Butte pedestrian bridge? This is Gail. I'll make a motion to approve resolution number 1443. Thank you, Gail. Is there a second? I'll second that. This is Patricia. Patricia, thank you for the second. Again, are there any questions or concerns, anxieties, comments? Hearing none, let's go to a roll call vote. Jason Beebe, how do you vote? Aye. Janet Hutchison? Aye. Patricia Youngman? Aye. Gail Merritt? Aye. Mr. Papke and Teresa Rodriguez are absent, and the mayor votes aye as well. So resolution number 1443 passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. OK. Um, that is it for our agenda, with the exception of visitors, appearances, and requests. Is there anyone who would like to speak to the council? 
Mr. Wilson, do you have anybody who would like to speak to us? There's one person on the hearing line. I'll unmute it now. Okay. Go ahead. Is there, is there anyone who would like to speak to the council? Apparently no comments are being made. So with that, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. This is Janet Hutchison. I'll make a motion to adjourn tonight's city council meeting. Thank you, Janet. Is there a second? Second. Jason, thank you for your second. Um, Jason, how do you vote? I or nay? Aye. Janet? Aye. Aye. Patricia Youngman? Aye. 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 And the mayor votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.